Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining our webinar this morning. Uh, we are excited to continue our webinar series, and today we're going to be talking about banner summer cleanup and prepping for student affairs and enrollment management. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, you should have come into the meeting on mute, so we do ask that you stay on mute uh, throughout the presentation just to cut down on any background noise. If you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to use the chat button uh, at the bottom of your screen, and we will address them at the end of the uh, webinar. And finally, this uh, recording, this webinar is being recorded, so we will send it to you after uh, today's presentation for you to reference back. Uh, so today, Linda Bloom will be our presenter. Uh, she's been in higher education for 35 years now. Uh, she's one of the senior consultants here at Forelli and has a lot of knowledge to share on this topic. So we're excited to have her present today. Thank you, Jessica. Well, welcome everyone. And um, we're gonna have a, uh, our do, uh, do our first poll, right, Jessica? Yep, we're gonna uh, launch a poll. If you wouldn't mind just answering the question in front of you, um, just so we know who's, uh, who's in the audience today. Give everyone a couple of seconds to vote. All right. So it looks like uh, the administration folks win it with 75%, and then we have 13% executive and 13% technical. Perfect. The perfect audience for this topic of conversation. And um, um, if I hit home too close for some of you, I apologize, but I've been there a long time and I know. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to take it from there. Thank you so much. So our agenda today, um, we're going to talk about, you know, enrollment management and student affairs. And, you know, it's summertime, right? Uh, ending up of a semester, uh, of a, a semester, an academic year starting new. You know, a great opportunity through all those vacations and holidays to clean up to, before we start all over again. We're going to talk about where to begin, um, the, the concept and the dimensions of communication and discussion, looking at daily operations of the process flows, and then I'm going to share an action plan that I've used uh, over all these years and a checklist that I developed along the way and I, of what worked and what I, what I found, what worked and what didn't work. And then we're going to just wrap up. Feel free to ask questions along the way, and um, we'll answer them as best we can. So why a cleanup? You know, number one question, why do you want to clean up? Everything's working. Well, we all know everything doesn't work. Um, this is a good time to identify what works and what needs improvement, right? We all know, we talk about it every day. <laughs> you know, no matter what department you're in, everyone knows what works and what doesn't work. But you just keep doing what you have to because um, patterns of communication, right? We talk to each other, but maybe the people who may be able to do something may not know what we're really going through on a day-to-day -day basis. So we could identify different options, maybe present different things that are not expensive, um, but could be cost-effective to help out in the situations that we have. So if something didn't work, you know, in the spring semester. Well, maybe we can fix it for the fall and here are some options. And then the dynamic re responsibilities. Even though we have set roles and we have skill sets to go with those roles, we all know in this ever-changing world, responsibilities change. And are we ready for them? And can we handle them? And do we have the resources and tools that we need to support the students? And so that's really the global aspect of the cleanup. And we're gonna go into details in all of this. So where to begin, right? You're at ac end of academic year, right? Beginning of new, it's always a good time. It's also good to do sometimes uh, at the end of each semester, but that's in an internal decision. You wanna identify the areas within student affairs and enrollment management that you know need some help. Um, for this particular area, um, I'm sure that you all have a lot of ideas about this one, but you wanna look at the key ones for this, for this particular kind of thing when you wanna do a summer cleanup. Your organization discussions based on student affairs and enrollment management, you know, either annual or by term, but they cover everything, right? Admissions, financial aid, billing, registrar, the catalog, right? Keeping that up to date. 
And then all those integrated third-party applications that we have associated with our Lucian products. And what's missing? We know it's missing, um, but how can we fix it? So summertime's a good time to also figure out a way to present this and give some options. And then my favorite, student support and help desk. I've gotten so many great ideas from the interactions and the help desk tickets of finding out what really does not work. You know, because sometimes no one tells you. So, but when you get really angry or if a student gets really angry, they put in a help desk ticket or they have a strong communication with someone or an interaction. That's when I always found out what, what really needed to be fixed immediately. So we'll, we'll come back to that one a little later. So let's just start with the basics, communication and discussion, right? Basic communication 101, right? It's a transfer of a message from one person to the other. Well, that's good. But that transfer of messages could be face-to-face, -face, could be digital, could be social media, could be part of admissions, part of registration, right? Student services, student affairs, and the whole retention and enrollment and recruitment of the whole admissions process. It all depends on what you wanna say and how you wanna say it to transfer the message. And also what information on a digital level do you want to be able to see so you can communicate the message to the students and or parent or guardian? That includes your intra and interpersonal communications or group, you know, you have probably meetings with your departments and then just the global mass communications. Maybe you're using BCM, Banner Communication Management. You know, how can you effectively get those messages and communications across? First, you need to identify the patterns. And I bring this up because this is gonna make a lot, you know, this will come together when we get to the examples of the checklist. You wanna identify patterns in your departments. Not every department communicates the same way, um, but we all think they do sometimes. Um, so it's the staff to staff and staff to student. We talk to each other very differently than we talk to the students, um, but some people don't. <laughs> some people talk to the way all the time. That may be a good effect and that may not be a good effect. And then there's the identity patterns of digital to digital and then digital to paper. So a perfect example of this is your website, right? Do you have everything you need? Um, that digital, or if you're using self-service banner, you know, everything on the self-service banner, you know, consistent with your website and admissions and registration and so on and so forth, advising. And then what about the paper forms, right? What about those request forms that people have to fill out to request certain access to things, to get information, you know, transcripts. A lot of schools to use a paper thing for transcript, you know, is it consistent with the digital requirements that you have and the formatting that you have in your communications? Ultimately, it comes down to the daily operations of the workflow. So you start with the items that everyone talks about and then kind of breaks the ice. And that goes back to the transfer of your messages and your meetings and your groups and your communications. It's easy to start your cleanup with the items that everyone always talks about or wants to change immediately. So let's just talk about daily operations real quick. Enrollment management, right? We all know this one, right? Coordinating areas of work, achievement, retention, everyone knows this area. But when it comes to, if you wanna break it down, it really comes down to your internal and external digital formats. And I keep coming back to this and I'll explain once we get to some examples. How we communicate in this day and age, we live on digital, right? Everyone, we cannot at this point, no matter what age you are, we cannot survive without, where it is, one of these. Um, we live by it. So we may talk and feel a certain way, but does that transfer over to the information that comes through in a digital format, through the admissions process, through the recruitment process, through the registration process, all the way to graduation into alumni? Is it consistent or does it change based on the level of where the student is in the process from getting accepted to the school to actual graduating and then becoming an alumni? It's a critical area 
um, because we forget that things change along the way and it's always changing. We also, you know, on the digital format, some schools have websites for their students and then they have sub websites for the parents or guardian because, you know, parents and guardian want to know what's going on with their student and they want to keep up to date for everything. So, you know, two of the schools I worked at, we had separate web pages, a whole separate web section just for parents and guardian. And we communicated with them on a regular basis, the same way we communicated with the students. What we found with that, now this was about three years ago, we found with that that all of a sudden our retention rates went up because we were communicating with the parents and guardians as much as the students. We never thought that was going to happen. We thought it was a complimentary option to give them, you know, transparent information. And it turned out to be a, a very eye-opening process that worked for us in the long, in the long run. Um, your low and high tech options, right? People still like paper, um, but you know, more and more, everything is digital. So do you have the, the paper options that equate to the digital options of the most important things that you need in enrollment management and through the entire process from admissions to graduation? The identifiers by student type and level. This is an interesting one because I did, I did a little study about five years ago um, where everyone in admissions, you know, they get accepted, the, the freshmen are excited, they come in, they, they're, they're catered to, um, every, you know, advising is there, registrar, the registrar is there, everyone is helping them out. And then all of a sudden by the sophomore year into the junior year, we found that retention rates were going down. Um, we did not know why, but we discovered, and I'll talk about this a little more, but briefly, we discovered that, you know, after missions, we assumed that students got comfortable. They were working with their advisor and their departments and everything, and they had all the information they need. What happened is they felt left out. They were so welcomed in the beginning, and then it kind of phased out that they didn't feel welcomed anymore, and they went someplace else. That's a big eye opener for us. So we recognize that the student level of where they are in their uh, academic history process, you know, has to be consistent. They have to feel um, comfortable along the way and feel like they're being supported so they can achieve their overall goals to being an alumni. And then the branding. Everything's about branding these days, right? It goes with the digital world, you know. Is your um, academic community and your environment branded the way you want to be represented? Now, is admissions branded the way it wants to be represented? Is registration, you know, the, all, the tran all the pieces between admissions and registration, are they branded the way it represents the academic community and the environment that you're in? And then from registration to graduation, is your environment and community branded the way you think it is or the way it should be to keep everything consistent? Because it's kind of like, you know, your students, your students come to you. It's kind of like going to a hotel. You have a lot of expectations when you get to a certain hotel, either a three-star, four-star, five-star, whatever you go to, you have an idea of what to expect. Students do too, of all ages, um, and not just, you know, you know, not just 18 year olds anymore. Um, one of my oldest students I had was 87 years old and she was going on 50 and she expected everything to be perfect. And we tried as hard as we could to make it her um, experience comfortable because it was the first time she actually went to college. So I learned a lot from that experience alone. Now, the other one, student affairs, right? So we're, we're on the other level of this. This is your, all your support areas. And we know this one well. We spend a lot of time with students. Emails, face-to-face, -face, and when they come to a kiosk, you know, how can we support them to meet their goals and their growth while they're with us at the college? And it's a tough one sometimes because they have expectations. We have ideas of their expectations, but they may not be on the same level. So again, all three that I talked about from enrollment management kind of come here too, I've discovered over the years. You know, internal, external, digital formats, your support system, 
Do you have the right tools in place? Social media, um, your website. You know, if you have an academic, if you're using Coursely for something or a third party thing for your catalog, is it consistent with everything else? Um, if you're doing scheduling, right? If you have Ad Astra or, you know, 25 Live Plus or, or you know, any college net product, anything for scheduling or space management, you know, is it consistent with everything else? And that becomes a real question and a good place to start looking. And then again, here with the parents and guardians, this was our largest uh, the college I, I was telling you about that we created a, a whole web section just for parents and guardians. This was our largest area for support. The parents want to know how their money was being spent and how their, their child was being treated. So we kept them up to date. We even used to have, you know, open block sessions with them um, because it was required of where the school and the environment was. Um, and again, we learned a lot. Um, digital open sessions are pretty interesting, um, especially in this day of COVID. I didn't have COVID then, but we learned a lot then. This now takes on a whole other level with the whole COVID issue going on. Again, identifiers that the students recognize. Are they the same identifiers that we think they should be recognizing? We'll go to that, get to that one a little later. Again, and then the last question, how do you and students represent your academic community and the environment. Something to think about, you know, because all of this fits together. None of these pieces, none of these pieces are, are individual as you're well aware. So let's talk about action plans, all right? Here's, here's action plan standard, you know, universal, right? We have a connectivity, right? Your initial interest of a school. Students want to go here. You know, why do they want to go here? You know, we have a lot of, you know, you, you run uh, surveys on why they want to go. You have recruiters, you know, everyone knows why they want to go. And then the initial entry. Some places require, you know, pre-exams or pre-courses to, to get to be a, a formal student. And then once that's completed, you know, you have the official uh, welcome, you know, welcome to our college kind of thing. And then the overall process, right? Here's where they spend two to four, however many years that they're there, getting to the final finish line, which is the graduation. Um, and if they continue um, in the same place, depending on the college or university, if they continue to another degree or cert certification, or they just become an alumni and get a job, it, you know, you want to stay in communication with them along the way. So the question is, through all this process, does your current infrastructure, and I'm not just talking building, I'm talking technology, I'm talking the office space, I'm talking your digital <laughs> Zoom space that we're all in, you know, does it match current and future expectations? And it's a tough question for people to think about, um, but it's something to review at least two to every two to three years to see how you're doing, to keep up with the changes in this ever-changing world. So we're going to go through this a little. So overall action plan. This is how I started mine. Someone said to me once, what is it you wanted compared to what is what you need? And it's a good question. You know, when I worked in the registrar's office in student affairs, you know, I knew what I wanted. <laughs> we all do. Um, but was it what I needed for student services and enrollment management? And the answer most of the time was no. It's things I knew I wanted that I thought would work out, but the truth is it wasn't in the, the right, it wasn't in the right place at the right time for the academic environment and the community. So we looked at, you know, what worked and didn't work. We looked at last year. That's how we started this. I started this 30 some years ago. Um, you know, what worked? Yeah, you know, I sat down with uh, staff members, IT included, and you know, what worked and what didn't work. We had a laundry list of what worked. We had a huge list <laughs> of what didn't work. So we looked at it and we started analyzing, okay, if we could change one or two things over the summer, right? We're talking two and a half months, maybe at the most, what could we do? What was important? What wasn't important? What was priority and so on and so forth. What did we need to move ahead? What would it take? So the ones that we chose, you know, what, what would we really need? What to take? Would be cost, you know, is it going to be expensive? You know, do we have to get other people, uh, consultants, so on and so forth? 
um, the goals and the targets, you know, what was easy to do quickly, right? Short term. And then how could we plan for the long term ones? And then we're going to monitor it. But who's going to monitor it? You know, everyone had a great idea, but no one wanted to monitor it. So we had to choose someone and someone actually volunteered. Every school I worked at, someone's always volunteered and said, you know, I'll monitor and evaluate. Um, and mostly it's someone who's going for a higher ed degree and use it, used it as a case study for a thesis or a doctoral dissertation. So it kind of worked out in that respect. Um, but that's a tough one. People, you know, we have all these great ideas, but, you know, let someone else do it. Um, the time frames, you know, varies by stage to stage. You know, a, a time frame that you want something for retention, it's going to be completely different than something for a graduation or registration. And then do you have the current resources you need? They don't have to be fancy. You know, they could be paper. But do you have the resources you need? All good questions. So here's what I've come up with over all these years. And the key steps after going through and reading countless action plans and taking several courses along the way and just practical experience, you know, what departments need to be reviewed and who will be involved? You know, sometimes it's the people right at the front line in the kiosk. You know, these are the people that know what's going on on a regular basis, minute by minute. Other times it's more senior staff. And sometimes it's senior staff working with the kiosk people together in collaboration. What's your overall evidence that exists currently or anticipated of the issues you may want to consider changing? This goes down to cause and effect. I have an existing issue right now. It might be in a registrar, but if I change it, is there a cause and effect problem? If I change A, will it affect B and C? And ultimately D will not work. That's a big one. And I came across this several times where we had to revert back to the way it was because it just didn't work for our academic environment. The internal assessment, right? We all have our own idea of what needs to be assessed. But if you look at all the facts and the evidence compared to what really needs to be assessed, as assessed is it the same? Ah, the ideal or close to ideal outcomes, you know, our wish list. Okay, so this is my wish list of, of everything I want. But if I can't get it, this, these are the options I can have to be close to my ideal outcome. It's a tough one. Some people don't like to change, but, you know, some people are willing to think, okay, maybe I can adjust a little just to move forward. Again, indicators to support your outcome internally and you know your environments. What indicators would you need to either adjust, change, or keep the same to move forward? And this also goes with internal and external options. Do you have any? You know, if I change something in emissions, will it affect billing, accounts receivable, um, or any other of the areas? Your measures um, require to confirm expectations. So if you measure something, what are your requirements to the overall expectations? It's a tough one for some people because they just may not know what to expect and what not to expect. And then can you identify too many changes or too little changes? I worked with someone one time that said, oh, everything is fine. And then four minutes later, she had a laundry list of things that, never, that didn't work. But if you asked her what you wanted to change, she said, oh, no, everything is fine. So, you know, you have to sit down and really recognize when, you know, when to identify um, too many changes or not, or too little changes. The overall current uh, and possible future costs. This is a tough one because none of us have money anymore. Uh, you know, our, our budgets are, are, are tight um, in most places, but a lot of things can be changed with very little cost. It's getting actually a group of people in a department to work together and collaborate with other departments. Because I found that a lot of times people are the, I notice that what needs to be changed um, are almost consistent and the same. So working together, they actually find a way for solutions. And that turns into the overall allocation. You know, if you have a little community working together, the allocations kind of seem to blend out conveniently. Um, short and long-term timeframes, you know, you want this done, how long is the time frame gonna be? Do you have, you know, what can you get done in two months? compared to what can you done in an, a week 
two weeks and so on and so forth. But what you want to get changed right away. But when it's all said and done, when all those are decided on and your action plan is in place, you know it's working when your oversights are recognized. And this is the cause and effect. So if I change something, you know, and if, if, is it not going to affect anything else? And that knows, that's when you know that things are, are leveled off, so to speak. Everyone knows what's expected. There's no surprises. Everyone's on the same playing field. They're starting with a, a baseline and they're building from there. And this actually comes into place with, um, with materials or resources. Um, when we started a lot of this action plan in schools I worked, I worked in, um, we had very few resources. And then what, you know, one or two people would start developing a how-to document, or they would find something online, or they go to the Elucian hub and they download a document. And then we, we'd read it and pull out what we need on a functional level. And then we created our own documents for you know, current employees and then future employees so we could all be consistent. So if we hired two or three people, we all were on the same level and we trained them as we were trained and, and experienced gave them experiences that we had to help them out in their job and also develop their skill set quickly. Strategies in place, recognizing over and under achievements, expectation and miscommunications. Again, this is a challenging one because you and I may be having a conversation. I may think you understand what I'm talking about, but you think that I understand what you're thinking. So this one, it needs a little more time to, to practice with some people. Some people understand this one right away. Others don't. I included. It took me years to uh, recognize that I was not completely listening to uh, the people talking to me. Um, and I had to slow down. And it works. When you slow down and you listen, you actually can hear what people are really saying. And maybe it's because I live in New York City. I don't know. Yeah, everything is fast here. Um, realistic resources are a place. I just brought, you know, briefly, I just mentioned this. Do you have your low tech and your high tech resources available to you? And all those, you know, you get a lot of freebies with the third party applications, you know, and if you haven't, if you don't have the links for them or haven't seen them, it's always worthwhile. Um, I one school, they had over 15, uh, 15 um, third party applications. They paid for them, they installed them, they made them active. We only used two of them. They just sat there for five years before someone remembered that they were still paying for them on an annual basis. So we discovered that one day purely by accident because we were looking to put in a new course catalog. And all of a sudden we discovered we had one all along, a digital one, and it was never used. So that's one of the things that I'm bad it's good to do. This is where the summer cleanup really helps. It's like, you know, opening up a closet and finding things that you totally forgot about. So resources, you know, realistically, do you have the resources? And maybe you do, you just don't know that they're there. And then a method in place to implement, monitor, plan, and pre-plan, you know? So your action plan takes, you know, a, sh a shape and a structure, depending on what you're comfortable with and what your environment expects or can accommodate. And that's where the method of placement and implement comes in. And then the overall process, you know, or overall effectiveness to your plan. You know, how are you going to measure it? How are you going to recognize it? And then, you know, continue it at the end of the summer. You know, what could you change to go forward? So let's, let's go through some checklists here. And these are practical experiences that I've, uh, that I've gone through over the years. And I hope, I hope they could help you. So the checklist has six components. Uh, very basic. Um, nothing, nothing special here. Again, after looking at umpteen amount of checklists over the years. You know, you need to plan, implement, and follow up, right? That's no surprise. So you pick your item, right? The big thing in the middle, and then you pull your evidence out. You know, why do you need to change? Is there a reason? What would it do if you changed it? Would it be good for um, X, Y, and Z departments? Would it only affect one department? You know, it's up to you to decide that. What are the indicators that will support this change? How would you put this in action? So if you got through your change, what is the action process that's going to be implemented? And then what tasks are required to finish getting this implemented, tested, and working? And then will it be complete? 
And even if it's complete on Monday, do you have to make adjustments by Friday? And then any other comments, you know, maybe you wanted something done in six months, I mean, six weeks, but you couldn't get it. You know, at, you know, at the 11th hour, you needed a couple more weeks. So the comments is good to just let people know what's going on. This is usually put on an Excel spreadsheet that you can define and, you know, it's, it's a project and you share with a bunch of people and they can, uh, each one can uh, edit and update along the way. So let's go through some examples. So here's enrollment management. These are things that I um, experienced and I'm sharing them with you because hopefully to get you to think, the thinking process here, to, to maybe you can relate to these and uh, see if it may or may not work for you. Number one, retention. So I worked at a school that had um, a lot of retention uh, issues, but no one ever thought about it. They actually thought, well, you know, we're, we're such a popular school. Everyone wants to come to us. We don't, it doesn't really matter. You know, so we may lose students sooner or later. It, it, it's okay. We have a lot of students that want to come to us. So the, we looked at the evidence and someone ran a little case study, a little data analysis. And they found out that by the second year, um, either the fall semester or the spring, they lost 65% of their students. Students moved on to, to another school or someplace else or another department. And people were surprised by this. It was like, wow, that's such a large number. So we, we wanted to evaluate why. And it turns out that it came down to, in we did surveys, uh, we talked to students, we talked internally, we talked to the people at the kiosk, we talked to the people who will answer the phone and find out what students are complaining about. Uh, we looked at websites, we looked at, you know, you, there's certain websites of you can complain if you don't like something about your academic school, we looked at those. And what it came down to is we identified an internal and external branding issue because people wanted to come to the school because of their perception of what the school could offer them. But once they got there, they felt like it was not the same. What their perception of was when they enrolled and was excited to be there about the second year, um, either fall or spring semester, um, had changed. They, it, they didn't see it the way they thought they would the year or two years before. And that was a big surprise to everyone. So we created an action uh, plan for this and we had a date range. This was a long-term one. This actually took over two years. I just, when I put the, the column complete, I just wrote date range because it varies based on what you need. So we, uh, it took over two years. And during those two years, we met some of the task of the perception and we had to reevaluate others. We had to reevaluate. So some of the, well, what, we, what we achieved is we updated our website, very clear. All the information was on the website, but internally, if a, if a student came to an office and they had a question, it doesn't matter what office, in the, in, where, wherever they were, they were expecting to be treated a certain way. Um, sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. We had to reevaluate and refocus people on the purpose of helping students. We also looked at the help desk tickets. Um, this school, if you had a complaint, you could put a help desk ticket. We had no idea how many help desk tickets uh, were sent in with certain complaints about everything. It was not about just technology. And, um, but they were just kind of filed. No one really looked at them. So this was a big wake up call to that particular school because every, everyone thought, well, you know, we're popular, so we don't have to worry about retention. And the truth is everyone does at this day and age. Next one, emissions duplications. So if you have 30, third party softwares, you probably have seen this one. Um, we had, we installed one at one of the schools and within, uh, <laughs> within six months, all of a sudden we had all these duplications. Uh, well, you know, I had, I had IT people saying to me, you know, you know that that this, you know, so-and-so person has 17 admissions applications. So we had to evaluate the data flow. And it turned out when they set up the software and did the transfer bridge from the, the third-party software to Banner, um, a couple of pieces were left out. And all of a sudden we had to reevaluate 
the, uh, the data specs and the transfer bridge and how the data flow was going through the system into the emissions office, then uh, obviously into Sagastian and the academic history. Um, so we had to adapt our business rules. Um, again, that was an internal thing, um, working with IT and various departments to reevaluate the business rules that would accommodate the third party application and also, excuse me, and also emissions. Registration, 15%. We had a problem with students registering um, and then seeing their grades and their courses through self-service banner. Um, but no one knew why. Again, it was installed, it was implemented. We put in some other third-party softwares to associate with it. And it turned out that it, it wasn't communicating all the data. Again, this was a data flow issue. So we had to reevaluate over the summer um, self-service banner. And look at all the connectivity and the directory paths of where the data was flowing to and from and how it was flowing. So we did a lot of test students with this one. And it turns out that it had to do with security options, right? So banner, right? Everyone in banner has is in a security class. Um, but if you have BCM or other um, applications associated with self-service banner, they have their own security classes. So all of a sudden we found that there was a conflict between the security classes and that's why the data flow wasn't happening. Graduation, this goes back to duplicate records. And I know some of you know this one, <laughs> um, you know, we had about 20% and it turned out that we had to reevaluate. we had to, the action was we had to look at the rules and codes. So for one of the schools quite a while ago, a couple decades ago, our rules and codes uh, hadn't been updated. They uh, were customized. You know, we had a couple IT people that didn't really like the way, you know, after SunGuard and, and Lucian came, came together, they didn't like the way uh, things were working. So they customized the, the applications for graduation. As time goes by, they moved on or retired and people just left them. And they didn't know that they were still very active, these customizations, because with every patch and upgrade of Banner, you know, we just thought everything was going fine. And it turns out we had to review all the customizations. There were 36 of them that very few people remembered even being installed. So we had to identify, the task was to identify the workflow and the overall process to the reporting because the reporting uh, tools that we were using were also out of date and were only bringing in a certain amount of students. And again, goes back to adjusting the codes and rewriting reports. So it gives you a little picture of some experience here, and I hope it helps you, you know, think about what you've seen along the way and what you would have to do to, to have these move um, to go forward. So student affairs, um, one of my favorite areas, financial aid. This is a challenging one because you have a lot of calculations and data review. So again, 10% financial charges were not, I mean, uh, financial aid changes um, were not happening. We had to look at, we had to look at the calculations and data. And then we identified the data respect and instead of monitoring on an annual basis, we had to monitor on a quarter basis because of the rules and regulations and guidelines of the school and the state that it's in. Advising, um, again, this, is a, this was a tough one and this had to do with implementing self-service banner um, and incorporating with the department requirements and also the banner pages that go with uh, academic history. Again, it turned out to be a security class. We had to evaluate and review the security classes so the advisors could work with the students in this new digital format. Um, and it, we had to monitor on a semester basis because advisors come and go just like faculty. Services, just overall services. You know, this included everything from space management, residency, um, department support, everything you could think of. And it came down to, we had to adjust the, the way staff were learning the skills to how to use Banner. And that's where the resources came in. We developed our own resources. So we created a little library and we put it in Blackboard. And so if people had a question, we could work with them face to face but they could also review the information and the self-guided tutorials and information on their own whenever they wanted. And then the digital formats. Um, 
One school I worked at, we, we had a great website going back about 15 years. Everyone was so proud of it, but we figured, you know, it was done. So nothing was really changed for about four years. And then all of a sudden we were losing, you know, people were complaining, we were losing enrollments and nothing, you know, just a lot of complaints and no one knew why. Well, it turned out because digital formats change <laughs> on a nanosecond, we didn't review quick enough. So all of a sudden we had to update all the information that went with our digital branding for our environment. So here, here's the, I'm gonna go through this real quick, but here are the, here are the basics of, of the areas for each one when it comes to banner and the things you probably should consider first over the summer in your cleanup. You know, uh, Lucene has this document, right? New, New Year startup checklist. And these are the key components for financial aid. This is a, you know, a challenging area because of the calculations, the FERPA guidelines, the rules and regulations of the state and federal, and everything has to be consistent. So this, I highly recommend if you've never gone through this document to go in the Elucian thing, and it is called New Year's New Year Startup Checklist Module. And each of these modules with all the sub -pa banner pages and the banner ta tables are good to be reviewed at least once or, or every other year, depending on your environment. Admissions, again, validation tables. Are they up to date? Um, are your codings up to date? Any changes over the last year? Do we need to adjust any codes or any validation tables to accommodate any of the changes? And with those tables, is there any, any components, any fields in the banner pages that have to be adjusted to support um, the overall admissions, including third-party uh, environments? Same with registration. You have your validation tables. And I know there's a lot more here, registration. I just highlighted that the key ones um, are the validation tables up to date. And in association, are there banner pages up to date? And can you see what you want for the information for the student to register? And then overall graduation, you know, your graduation pages is again, are the tables associated? All the other tables with registration go into graduation, but uh, is everything up to date? Does your staff have access, the access they need to view and accommodate what they need for the graduation process? And then the alumni process. Once graduation's done, do, do you use the alumni process? There's a couple of things here in uh, Banner that you can actually incorporate with your alumni process. And then from there, if you're using Banner Communication Management, you can actually you know, send out communications to your alumni. And, and have them, you know, events, uh, matching gift uh, status. It's a banner page. Uh, you can have this all incorporated and communicate with your former students through BCM. It all fits together. As you probably know, in, in, in Lucian products, there's not one, one or the other. So real quick, overall, everything I just showed you, you know, what do you need? You need to identify the areas of production. You know, some areas may need rethinking, as I, as I was telling you. Um, you have to allow for understanding of the requirements and the missing pieces. You know, you have, to, you have to accept the fact that there are missing pieces, but some of them aren't that bad. Some of them are easy to fix. What would be the time management for this? And is it in line with your academic community and environment? So real quick, next steps. You know, it comes down to this. You start with items everyone talks about. Let's get rid of the easy stuff. Then define the relevancy and the importance of it. Are there patterns, timeframes? How will you proceed? How many departments? How many areas? Is, you know, do you co coordinate this with staff and support staff? What will be your plan of action? How will it create based on your environment and your checklist? How will that equate based on your environment? It's okay to try, adjust, try, implement, try again. It's really okay. You don't have to do this first time because you learn a lot along the way. And then the overall implementation to developing the resources each area needs. And then what you don't finish this year, you start again next year. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. I hope this helps um, because you know it's, it's been an interesting 35 years. Um, and I'm proud to, to now work with Forelli and be able to work with uh, academic environments 
and help people out, hopefully give them the trick, tricks of the trade that they don't have to uh, go through some of the stuff that I did. <laughs> and that's about it, Jessica. Great, thank you so much, Linda. A lot of great information in that uh, session, so thank you. Um, I do not see any current questions in the chat, so if anybody okay. does have a question, feel free to type it in, or at this point, if you'd like to come off of mute, um, feel free to do so and, and ask your question live. Yeah, I talk a lot, sorry, I apologize, <laughs> but I hope it helps. Okay, so Anne, thank you, Linda. You point out some great resources. Uh, yes, the webinar recording will be made available, and you'll get an email with the recording link. Uh, additionally, we do place it on our website on the What's Happening page. So for any of our previous webinars that have been recorded, you can find, uh, find them there, as well as our upcoming webinar schedule. So it's a great uh, page on our website to, uh, to be able to find upcoming and past webinar information. Right. All right, well, if nobody has any questions, oh, contact information. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Linda there, we can do the uh, info, info at Forelli.com. Um, so you'll get to all of us. And then 888-864-3282 is our main line as well. Um, and we'll have one of the account managers reach out to you uh, directly. So you have their information. Well, I just want to thank you for sitting through this. It's not an easy conversation. No one likes to have it, but we all know it's necessary. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule today to spend the last hour with me. Thank you again. Have a great day.